Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it awesome outside? Yes. Yes. We'll take it. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to say, can we move outside? <laughs> All right, for those of you watching online, welcome. We're glad to have you with us as well. For those of you that are here, I don't often, well, sometimes I bring up my phone, but I'm going to challenge you this morning. Why don't you get your phone out? And after you silence it, I want you to go look to, if you have Facebook, go to your Facebook page. And then pull up Grace Street Church. And on that page, you're going to see something. You're going to see the live. And down at the bottom of the live screen, there is a little button that says share. I want you to tap on that and then hit share now. You can even type something in there, like I'm gonna just type in join us. Share. And that is an easy way to share with everybody without, for those of you that are introverts, you don't talk to anybody. How great is that? All right, done playing with my phone, I'm gonna put it away. All right, got that out of the way. Next up, announcements. So uh, this week we are on, believe it or not, week six of eight of our series on uh, season four of The Chosen. And so we look forward to uh, sharing that with you today. Mark has a message this morning about God's chosen people. And then this Wednesday, we'll be watching the episode. So we invite you to join us at seven o'clock on Wednesday evening for that. Then, next up after that, we've got a little bit of a break on the weekends until November, and then we get busy again. So, men, if you know someone that would enjoy coming and uh, just enjoying a good free meal, talking with other guys, and sh just sharing a time of devotion, uh, enjoy, invite them to join us on Sunday mo or on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. on the 2nd. This whole area right here, uh, we've set up the tables and it becomes a little restaurant. The table that has all those books on there, oh, by the way, those books are free, so if you want to go look at them after service, go look at them, take what you want. But that table will get a black stone grill on it. Then we'll have crock pots and some other stuff in the kitchen, and we'll have a great meal. So I invite you to join us for that. That same day, see when I say we get busy, we get busy. That same day, we're going to show the nativity story. And this, uh, this movie is the birth of Jesus from Mary's point of view. It is done very, very well. And we invite you to join us for that. It is a free movie. The doors open at 5.30. The movie is six concessions free until they run out, which they have yet to run out. Um, so hot dogs and popcorn and brownie bites and other things end up showing up. So it's a great time. There's always something to drink. And uh, we just invite you to join us for that. Then, I can't believe we're saying this, the final race of season 19 is on November 9th. So registration starts at 9.30, racing at 10 o'clock. This past week, I've done a little bit of changing around on our website. Um, we used to have a, something that just said race videos, and there was a history tab, but that got broken. Been out uploading pictures, and I'm seeing kids from 2006 that were like this tall that I now know are adults, grown up, some of them are married, um, having their own kids. Uh, our young man who designed uh, this, this logo on here, he's not happy with it, he's gonna redesign it for year 20. But I found him in one of his first times being with us back in August of 2010. So, <laughs> it's a key patient. <laughs> I showed it to Mark, he goes, that's Jordan? <laughs> yep. So uh, we're looking forward to that more at orangetrackracing.org. And then over the winter break, we'll be putting up a, our new track. So we're excited about that as well. Now, you're probably not expecting to see Advent <coughs> on the screen already, but Mark and I have learned from years in ministry that these things sneak up on us really fast. So this is only for a sign up for Advent reading. So each uh, Sunday during service, 
We'll have the Advent wreath up here. There'll be a reading and a lighting of the candle. If you would be interested in doing that, a quarter of the slots are already filled. That sounds really big, doesn't it? It's only one. But there, there are three other weeks available to sign up. I'll have it on the back table there uh, so you can sign up after service if that's something that you are interested in. Uh, so we invite you to uh, join us in participating in the service that way. For those of you watching online, be sure to check out the link in the comments there to our messages page on our website, gracestreet.church slash messages. If you forget the link, you can't click on it, just go out to gracestreet.church, click messages right there on top. It'll say uh, playlist for October 20th. You'll want to uh, listen to the music that's been curated to go along with this very important message today. With that, let's slow things down a bit and go to God in prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Memories showed me and my wife that just four short years ago it was snowing on the same days. But today we're expecting highs in the 80s of the sun. What a beautiful day. We thank you so much. We thank you for the blessing of this place where we meet each week. We, bless, we thank you that you bless us, that you are here well amongst us. Father, we ask that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to hear the message that you have for us today. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah. 42nd book, verses 6 and 7. This is from the New Living Translation. It says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. This is written hundreds of years ago, or hundreds of years before Jesus is even born. And God is calling us into a covenant relationship. Part of Jesus' mission on earth was to demonstrate God's righteousness. And in order to demonstrate God's righteousness, he had to teach others. Because he knew what his mission was, and it would eventually take him to the cross. But did you see, you could see the words on the screen, but did you hear what it said? You will be a light to guide the nations, plural. So it was salva extending salvation far beyond Israel to the entire world. And through Christ, everyone has not only an opportunity to be a part of God's family, but to also share in Jesus' mission. It's through this covenant relationship that we're called to serve God by being his light in this dark world. And we all know that, you know, it feels really dark right now. It's been dark for a long time. It's just different actors doing the same things. But by being his light, we are allowing others to see the hope that we have, the joy that we get, and when the world gets a chance to meet someone famous, we see this all the time. People get to see someone famous. We get to uh, maybe even interact with them. Maybe it's a concert. You got backstage passes and you get to go meet and greet with somebody famous. And what happens? You get really pumped up. You're charged. It's like, wow, look what I got to do. Look who I got to meet. What a privilege. If only people got as excited as I did last night when Iowa State scored that final score and went to being 7 and 0. Yes! Why can't we be that excited about God? Yes, Jesus! We need to be that excited and to consider it a privilege that we get to share the mission of Jesus Christ. 
Matthew 6.33 tells us that we are to seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. And when I read that last couple of sentences, you will open the eyes of the blind. Maybe not like Jesus did, but opening their eyes to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And freeing the captives from prison, not necessarily literally going and helping someone get out of jail. Here's your get out of jail free card, right from my monopoly set. No. You get out of jail free card from God, from your sin. That will get them out of that dark dungeon. Oh, Lord, you have graced us and blessed us so much. Thank you. Lord, we look forward to hearing the words that you've given to Mark this morning. We look forward to hearing that we are your covenant people, Father. Let us be so enthusiastic, so charged up, so excited, and to consider it a true privilege that we get to share you with the rest of this world. In Jesus' mighty name. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody this morning? Good. Awesome. Awesome. That's the way it should be. Well, as I usually tell you, the same thing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, if you remember, for those of you who were with us at the time, about a year ago, I, I talked about that in a sermon. On why we're called to rejoice each and every day. Because... God put that joy in our heart, and we are to expound that joy out to others each and every day, rejoicing in the fact that God has given us another day in his presence, another day of life, a fresh start. Each day starts anew for us, and that's a wonderful thing. That's a reason to rejoice. And if you start your day with that kind of attitude, just think what's going to happen for the rest of your day. It's going to be great going to be great. Well, today we're going to talk about episode six of The Chosen here in season four, and I got to tell you, there was a lot of stuff going on in here. So the message today is going to be kind of three parts in here. Normally we try and pick the overarching thing, but he's got three this time around. So I've kind of had my work cut out for me, but truly it all ties together in the fact that uh, we are called to be God's covenant people. So I'm going to jump all the way back into Genesis to kick this thing off. And in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the Lord said to Abram, he wasn't quite Abraham yet, but he soon to be the same guy. So go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So he was pretty specific in what was going to happen there. And it's a great message to those people, to his chosen people at the time. And that's where Israel becomes the chosen people of God. But do you see what it said in there? Did you catch it? Some people got lost in this message. It says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing to the other nations. He's calling them to be a covenant people to everyone. Everyone. Not just to the nation of Israel to set them apart. You see, that's where a lot of people get confused. And it says all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Not just the Jewish community. Not just the Jewish peoples. But all of the nations of the world will be blessed through you. He was setting them up at that point in time to be the example of God's covenant people to all the rest of the people on earth. All of them. 
So this is God's covenant with his chosen people. So, you know, what does that really mean for us today? We hear that term God's chosen people, and most people, it thinks it just means the Jewish people as a whole, and that was it. Well, if you were in the Sanhedrin, if you were the high priest, the prophets of the day, and those kind of things you look at throughout history, what did they do? They immediately did what? They concentrated on the Jewish people alone. So most under, don't understand why they were chosen above all others. But in fact, the Jewish leaders missed that point completely, entirely. And they need to go back and kind of reread their Torah and figure it out. Because God says, I'm going to make you a blessing to all of the nations, to all of the peoples. And so what he was doing, he says, I'm going to give you favor. I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the rest of the nations. I'm going to show you how to be a godly people, how to reflect my will upon the rest of the world, how to set yourself as an example for that to illustrate then what it means to be a godly people to the rest of the nations of the world. And that's what the covenant was. That's what it was all about. It wasn't so, we're the Jewish people and we're above you and we're greater than everyone else. It was so that they could humble themselves and show the wonderful things that God was doing in and through them. Well, you know, as, as things tend to do with men, things kind of get uh, rearranged in the order of things that's supposed to happen. Uh, so the Jewish leaders miss the point entirely. So then we go through this whole litany of things that have to happen throughout the Old Testament. You see, he sent judges, he sent laws, he gave uh, people certain privileges and rights and said, do these things, do these things. He gave them the Ten Commandments, the, the Law of Moses, and he said, here is what it means. Here's ten things to do. And if you do these things, you will be a godly people and you will live a fulfilled life. But they turned it around and said, thou shalt not do this and this and this and this. And people look at it as a punitive measure instead of, hey, live like this. And guess what? You won't have all the problems in your life. That's what God was telling them. Now, when I was growing up, it was like, oh boy, you know, God's up there. He's just waiting for me to do one thing wrong. And then I'm going to get it, you know. I'm going to get kicked out. I'm not going to be one of the numbers. I won't be able to be in there. And that's the way I looked at the Ten Commandments. But then, you know, I had this great uh, seminary professor that went through this whole thing with us. And I was going, oh. So, you know, after 35 years, the light bulb finally turns on and says, oh, this is what it's about, huh? But it wasn't until somebody could actually explain that that this is what God was actually saying and doing and telling the people so that they could be that covenant people. He, he gave, them, gave it to them in writing. Now, this is what it means to be godly. This is what it means to be a godly people. And this is how you need to act so others can see you acting this way and understand what a fulfilled life's all about. They missed the point. We'll get more to that. So Jesus then used an example in this episode of the chosen of the sheep and the shepherd to illustrate the point to the members of the Sanhedrin that he was standing in front of and his own disciples, but they still didn't get it. And so I'm going, I want to read this. So John 10, 1, uh, 6, yeah, 1 through 6 is, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter through the sheepfold door, but climbs up another way, is the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door by the shepherd is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger but flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. And Jesus used this illustration, but they didn't understand the things that he spoke to them. He spoke a lot in parables because, understand, at the time, 
it was easier to relate to a story that they could see things in their own lives and they could relate to them better than simply giving them edicts and messages and, and things like that. And so we didn't have a lot of the people, most of them were not highly educated, most of them didn't go to school back in those days. It was only a select few that went. So we would talk to parables so they could relate to them and so that they could understand what he was trying to say. Now here Jesus is trying to tell the people of the meaning of the covenant of God that he made with Abram, soon to be Abraham, and the Jewish nation as a whole when God gave the covenant to Abraham then, it was so that the Jewish nation, by their actions, by their faithfulness, by their very lives, would be a living example to the whole world of the glory of God. And in doing so, reveal the glory of God and his works for them. That's what this covenant's all about. So the Jewish nation, by their actions, by their faithfulness to God, following those commandments, those things that he laid down to say, this is how you become a godly people. By their very lives and be a living example to the whole world of the glory of God. Look what the wondrous things God will do in your life if you just simply have faith. Have faith. And so in doing so, they would reveal that glory of God and his works to all the nations. But see, through time, what happened? They did the opposite. They kind of fell away from the message. They lorded over the rest of the nation, shut them out of the world that God created for them to share in as an example of being the covenant people. They did just the opposite of what God wanted them to do. And if you remember, anybody that wasn't Jewish was considered unclean, right? So you couldn't have anything to do with them. But God wanted just the opposite. We want you to show these people what a godly people is all about. So that they in turn can become godly people. People of God. Missed the point completely. So instead of uniting all the nations uh, as the people of God, they alienated themselves from the rest of the world. And so finally after all the other stuff that God did throughout the Old Testament to try and bring them back into being a covenant people. If you notice, what, what did he keep trying to do over and over again? He tried to reinstate the covenant. He sent judges and kings and everyone to them, and they still missed the point, and they still shut everyone else out, excluded themselves to themselves, alienated them from the other nations. And we see that over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. So God says, I'm going to come down myself. I'm going to straighten you guys out. So he comes down in the form of Jesus. But when God sent Jesus to be reconcile all the peoples of God back together and do it right, well, the religious leaders saw him as an affront to their stature and power, and so they sought to silence him and to discredit him to the very people that he was there to save. So let's go on with, the, uh, with John verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most surely I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find pasture. The thief does not come to except to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they could have life and that they may have life more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling who is not the shepherd the one who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even though I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and the other sheep which I have are not of his fold, I, them I must also bring. 
and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Now, he had to spell it out. He still used kind of the same terms that they could relate to. But finally, the gathered religious leaders were getting to catch on to what he was saying. So this was about as big of, of an in-your-face as you could get for them. So what did they do? In their humanness, they acted accordingly. Now, if they would have listened to the words, they would have known that he was not an affront to them. He'd be a threat to their power and their way of life, because if you notice, they had very ornately adorned garments and everything, and they lived pretty, pretty well off, off of the people that they subjugated underneath them with their laws. So some of them understood completely and others were simply enraged by his words. So they, wanted to, so they wanted him to commit blasphemy in their presence so they could immediately pass judgment and stone him to death at that point. So John tells us then in John chapter 10, 25 through 30, Jesus answered them. And he said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So that was what they were looking for. They were looking for him to commit blasphemy by saying that he and the Father were one and that the Father had sent him and that he was there directly from the Father. And so in the Jewish terms and conditions, they ended underneath their laws, and they had over a thousand of them. He said, well, you committed blasphemy. And according to the Jewish laws of the high council, then they could stone him to death at that point in time. And they picked up rocks and they tried to stone him. But he slipped away. They were blinded to who he was and what he had come to do. See, their whole power, all of their money, all of who they had been, their whole identity was built upon being lorded above the people that they were there to serve. Instead of coming to serve the people and bringing them to God, they brought the people and lorded over them with the law instead. So they were blinded to who Jesus was and what he had come to do. And according to John, we see this all happen during the Feast of the Dedication which should have been a very special time. All of the religious leaders would then gather together during the Feast of the Dedication. Now everyone here knows what the Feast of the Dedication is all about, right? Right? Okay. Okay. So, the Feast of the Dedication, or Hanukkah, as most know it now, it's also called the Festival of Lights. Because all of the lit menorahs during the eight days of that feast the eight days of Hanukkah, they would put the lit menorahs above their uh, post on their door frame, so all of the doors of the people would be lit up during that eight days, and they would light a one light each night as they recanted then the, uh, the Feast of the Maccabees. So it originally was the Feast of the Maccabees. Everybody knows what, everything about the Maccabees, right? Okay, so, so, the Feast of the Maccabees was an eight-day winter festival celebrated by the Jews in the month of December or sometimes late November, depending upon when the lunar solar Jewish calendar fell. So they operated on a little different calendar than what everyone else did. The history of the Feast of the Dedication goes back to the intertestamental period and the Maccabean revolt against uh, King Antiochus Epiphanes 
who profaned the Jewish temple and forced the Jews to abandon their sacrifices to God, adopt pagan rituals instead, and a group of Jewish fighters, the Maccabees, rose up and what, what do you think they did? Well, they had a revolt. And so they rose up and they defied that oppressive pagan regime that was there. They overthrew the Seleucids, which was who the people were at the time. That was the name of the people. The temple in Jerusalem was then rededicated to God, cleaned because they brought in all these sacrifices and had they were sacrificing pigs on the altar and there was pigs blood splattered everywhere. So they had to clean that entire temple area. The inner sanctum of the temple was completely defiled. All of their oils and their, their first pressing. So um, if you guys don't know about that, the, the first pressing of oil went to God as first fruits. And that's where that came from. So the first fruits were the pressings that they would light the candles in the temple with. And so they were burning oil in there. So they had defiled all except for one vessel which was still sealed by the priests. And that's the one vessel that they found of oil that they could still use that was not defiled by the pagans that had come in. So the Feast of the Dedication then had been celebrated to commemorate this meaningful event in Jewish history when the Maccabees overthrew that regime that was in there. The original Feast of Dedication involved a miracle according to the rabbinic traditions. When the Jews re-entered the temple, they could only find one small sealed jug of olive oil that hadn't been profaned or contaminated, contaminated by the Seleucids. And they used that to light the menorah in the temple and though the oil was only enough to burn for one day, it burnt for eight days instead. And that in itself was a miracle. That was God's sign to them that he was rededicating the temple as well. And so they had celebrated for years and years and years then the festival of the lights. That's what that's about. So there's eight in the, eight in the menorah and they light one each day. The reason that Hanukkah at the last for eight days is because the oil lasted for eight days. Okay, so now you're all caught up on Hanukkah, the festival, right? The Seleucids, we know all about that. We know all about the de defilement of the temple and everything. <sighs> so we've been through two of the points so far. So now we need to talk about the chosen one of God, bringing God's covenant people back to that relationship with God. God's covenant person was foretold years in advance. Years in advance. As a matter of fact, God sent the message to Isaiah 600 years in advance so that the people would be aware and catch and watch for the signs of the coming Messiah. They've been waiting, waiting, and waiting for the coming of the Messiah. So Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, 49, 1 through 9, 50, 4 through 11, 52, 13 through 53, and 53, 12 are all termed as what is the servant songs or poems that recant God's purpose of sending the chosen one back to the people of Israel. So he told them all about this through Isaiah. Isaiah wrote it out so they could sing it in chants, in songs, so therefore they would remember it. And these are some of the things that they sang in the temples, except when you hit Isaiah 53. That one's left out. They never opened that scroll for some reason. I wonder why. Okay, now we're caught up on those. So these songs describe the Lord's chosen servant that he is going to send them. These verses then show us that the servant serves the Lord in humility and in faith, living righteously, helping the oppressed. Sound familiar? Sounds like Jesus walked on the earth, right? Well, that's exactly what it was about. God foretold this 600 years before Jesus showed up. Jesus was the God-sent living example to the people to get them back into a right relationship with God. That's what righteousness is, is a right relationship with God. That's what righteousness is all about. 
So, ah, throughout history then, the identity of the servant had been interpreted in various ways, including the nation of Israel itself, the ideal Israel, if you could have an ideal. They tried to assign it to various individuals, and then finally the Messiah. When all the others didn't play out, they finally decided, well, this is going to be the coming Messiah. So, this may account for some of the confusion or misidentification of Jesus as the chosen one of God when he did come. Because the priests were trying to assign it to anything and everything else but Jesus. So when Jesus walked among them, they go, well, he can't be it. Right? Well, we then, we then, as disciples of Christ, are to do the same as Jesus did for others. And that is to walk in humility and in faith, living righteously, helping the oppressed, and being a servant and having a servant heart for everyone else. What did Jesus say? He said, I came to serve, not to be served. When he was talking to Martha, we heard that in the episode. So he set the living example of a servant of God for us so that we would know then how we as his disciples, having a right relationship with God, should act and should be for one another and for other peoples. Now we see this prevalent in the world today, right? Yeah, no, not so much. It's just kind of the opposite. It's kind of the opposite. So we got our work cut out for us. We're his disciples, so it's up to us. So our mission is to bring the scripture to those who don't know it, and we are to do so with the servant's heart. The servant's mission is described as this. The Lord gave the sermon as a covenant to the people to be a light to the nations, bringing hope to those imprisoned by sin. God's people are to take up Jesus' servant role and extend his hope then to all nations. All nations. To be covenant people of God is to be missionary people. And that's what that's all about. We're on a mission to bring God's word to people who don't know it. Or for people who think they know it, give them the right words. Not the stuff that got watered down in the process but the true words of God. In a word, that's called evangelism. And God called his spirit-filled servant to bring righteousness to his world and to his word and to fulfill his covenant to bless the nations. We go back to that Genesis 12, 1 through 3. See, God had already sent the others in the priests and the scribes of the day. But what happened? They prostrated God's message into serving themselves and leading the people to serve the law instead of being covenant people that God desires. See, the people were so busy trying not to break one of the thousand laws. They had 600 written laws and they had over 400 unwritten laws that the Jewish people had to conform to each and every day of their lives. And if not, they were, what? They were marked unclean and they were ostracated from the Jewish people. They were cast out. That's not what God wanted. That wasn't even part of God's message ever, ever. God's plan from the start was to have a covenant people who would serve as the example to the rest of the nations of what godly people would look like, act like, serve like, and they all missed the point. They all missed the point. Here's another part of this. God reveals to his people in his timing, not ours. Now, a couple of months ago, we talked about this a little bit. And uh, we see in the scripture several times where it mentions that he made them blind to who he was and then revealed himself to them when the time was correct. And we see that happen over and over again, right? If we remember back, then that is called a Kairos moment. Remember? The Kairos moment. When God's timing is right, he will reveal himself and his purpose unto us. And that's called a Kairos moment. <clears throat> that comes from the Greek. 
That was back when I was teaching all the Greek and Hebrew mm -hmm. stuff here. So, uh, when God's timing comes to pass then, he reveals his truth to us. When God's time comes to pass, then he reveals his truth to us. In this episode, we see many things going on from the confrontation with the Sanhedrin to the meaning of Hanukkah to God's perfect timing. See, a lot of times we don't understand God's perfect timing because it doesn't come in our time. And that tells us that we are not in step with God's will or trying to be enforcing our own will. That means we're out of step with God. That means we're out of step with God. We see Jesus use a Kairos moment in the raising of Lazarus, which was his last miracle before he was handed over. The story of Lazarus accomplishes several things. It highlights Jesus' authority over death, and it offers a profound example of the hope of resurrection through faith in him. And we got to make sure we catch that point, that the resurrection was through faith in Jesus. Lazarus had faith in Jesus. They grew up together. They were best friends together as they were growing up. Lazarus realized who he was, and he had faith in him. His sisters, Martha and Mary, also had faith in Jesus. They had a true and profound faith in Jesus in who he was and what he could do and what he was sent to do. The story of Lazarus accomplishes several things. It highlights Jesus' authority over death through people who had faith in him. I want to make sure I get that point really clear because that's part of God's covenant through the New Testament, through Jesus. That is part of God's covenant through Jesus. That's what the New Testament's all, all there for. Okay. Ah, so, Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, were dear friends of Jesus. And when their brother fell Ill, fell Ill, the sisters sent a messenger to find Jesus and to tell him that Lazarus was sick and he needed to come immediately. Instead of hurrying to see Lazarus, Jesus remained where he was for two more days. When finally Jesus arrived in Bethany, Lazarus had been dead in his tomb for four days. Jesus ordered that the gravestone be rolled away, and then the, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, there was a gathering of people around him at that time, and Mary and Martha were there, his disciples were there, some of the members of the Sanhedrin who had been following Jesus around, some of the Pharisees were there, to witness this as well. A Kairos moment. Kairos moment. See, that time was right. That time was right for him to do that miracle to those people so they could witness that Jesus actually had the power to do what he could do and that he was who he said he was. So, Throughout the story of Jesus or of Lazarus, Jesus delivered a very powerful message to the disciples, to the religious leaders, and to the world at that point in time. Jesus has the power over death, and those who believe in him will receive resurrection life. In this story of Lazarus, Jesus spe speaks out one of the most powerful messages that he ever gave ever in one sentence. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ receives the spiritual life that even physical death can never take away. Even though our bodies will die, our spirit will remain in the presence of the Lord. As a result of this incredible miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, many people then believed that Jesus was the Son of God and they put their faith in Christ. And it started spreading. And it spread quickly. Through the raising of Lazarus, Jesus showed the disciples in the world that he had the power of death. It's absolutely essential to our faith as Christians that we believe in the resurrection of the dead. See, no other religion on the face of the earth has a resurrected Christ, has a resurrected Savior, has a Messiah. 
to save us of our sins. And if we don't have that belief in that resurrection power, then we are dead in our sins as we stand here or as we sit. That's the truth of it. That's the truth of it. If we don't have that belief in resurrection, we're dead in our sins because then there is no life released from sin. There is only spiritual death. Furthermore, Jesus revealed his compassion for his people through a genuine display of emotions. And we see this as Jesus was weeping for Lazarus. Even though that he knew that Lazarus would live, he was still moved to weep with the ones that he loved. Jesus cared about their sorrow. He was not timid to show emotion. And we shouldn't be ashamed to express our true feelings to God as well. He set a great example for us. And as this week, I, I had a death of a close friend. <laughs> so as I was writing this, and I was writing the funeral service for tomorrow, um, this really, <laughs> really hit me hard. It really hit me hard. And it made me think a lot. And it made me think, are we living a life well lived? Are we living that life, that covenant life that God wants us to live? Are we called and, and answering the call that God called us into to live a covenant life? And if not, we're simply dead. We're dead in our sins. And we're just going through the motions. That's a heck of a realization to come to. Well, like Martha and Mary, we can be transparent with God because he... He cares for us and wants a personal relationship. He wants us to know him by name, to call him by name. He doesn't want a casual relationship. He wants us to know him. God wants us to know him, not know of him. Not know of him. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. You might know of somebody, but you really don't know them. That means you don't have a relationship with them. So God really is calling us into a relationship where we know him intimately. Because he said that that relationship then will move in our lives in a different way. And we will be moved to be a covenant person with God in a right relationship, that righteousness that he wants for us. See, God doesn't need that for him. He wants that for us. Understand? So Jesus traveled to Bethany because he knew Lazarus would already be dead and that he would perform an amazing miracle there. In a Kairos moment for the glory of God. That would awaken many people and that would awaken their hearts. That would bring them then into a covenant relationship with him. Unfortunately, for a lot of people, seeing is the only believing that they will have. And so he showed them this miracle. Many times we wait for the Lord to answer us in our time, in the midst of a terrible situation, and wonder why he doesn't re respond more quickly. Oftentimes, God allows us his situation to go from bad to worse. Because... He's planning to do something very powerful and wonderful. He has a purpose that will bring even greater glory to God in that process. It's horrible for us as we're going through it. Been there, done that several times. It's not good and we can't see what God's purpose is while we're in the midst of that storm. But we always must remember that our will is not the same as God's will. And we may not understand his ways, but they are always true, and they're for the correct reason. They're always true for the correct reason. When we pray, the man answer may not come until it's the right time. That Kairos moment, that Kairos time, 
that God wants to use the answer to do something powerful in our lives and maybe someone else's at the same time. But yet, the answer might be no. We might be asking for something God doesn't want us to get involved with. And because the answer may come in very many different forms, we may not realize that he already answered our prayer. When we think he hasn't answered it all. Mary and Martha thought he looked past their need, ignored their plea, and that's why Lazarus died. But see, the answer had yet to come. Same with us. We are called to have faith in the middle of that storm. The point of here is to pray no matter what because he cannot answer what we don't ask. He can't ask what we don't ask. If we ask from a pure heart, the word tells us that he will answer our prayers. By prayer and petition, if we come to him with an earnest heart, our prayers will be answered. We just have to understand that he may answer it in a different way than what we are wishing or wanting or expecting at that point in time. Let us pray. Father God, open our hearts to understand your ways are not always our ways, but your ways are always true and good. In our humanness, we sometimes miss the bigger picture because we're too close to the problem at hand. Help us, Father God, to have faith, to have patience that in your perfect time, you will make what happens what needs to happen. Open our hearts to be your servant, to know those who do not know you and who need to know you. Help us reach out to them, empower us and embolden us to be your hands and feet. Teach us to go forth out of love with an abundance of grace to meet those who are lost in this world. God, put it upon their hearts to hear that message of grace and of mercy and of love and help us to be patient in your time and in your ways. And we thank you, Lord, that you grant us our prayers even when we cannot see your works. Keep us, keep us either ever faithful to you. In Jesus' name. Think about the preparation for this meal. Jesus says, Oh, go set it up, get the things on. The preparation started before the eternity when God started his plan in motion. And this meal that we celebrate each week, it was preceded. Mark talked about we have to serve. It was preceded in service as Jesus took off his cloak wrapped an apron around his waist, grabbed a bowl of water, and washed each of the disciples' feet. He served. And the meal, in and of itself, is a reminder to us today that of his ultimate service to us on the cross. The next few days events start as he says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then benounce to the disciples when he says, this is the cup of the new covenant, my sin poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. They didn't know yet what was about to happen. We do. We thank God for that each and every day, and especially as we share this meal together. The body of Christ broke for you to take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you to take and drink. Heavenly Father, you 
set this in motion before you even created us. You had already planned to make us right in your eyes. Father, let us go out and serve our neighbors, our family, our friends. Let them see the hope that we have in you. Because just as we heard in our call to worship at the beginning of the service, we are to go to all of the nations, helping them to see the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. It's good to be back. Um, so now it's time for prayers for the people. And if there's anyone who would like to me to pray for them, let me know. All right. Well, we got lots to pray for anyway. So, Father God, please let the Holy Spirit rest among us as we pray for each other today. Clear our hearts and minds of the troubles of this past week so that we can praise your holy name as we should. For you are a gracious, wonderful, mighty God, a consuming fire that melts the chains and strongholds of this life so that we can freely worship you as we should. We honor you today for you are our rock and our shield, our ever-present help in times of trials and troubles of all kinds. You are Yahweh Suri, the Lord my rock, who strengthens and defends his people from every kind of trouble this earthly realm can throw at us. We speak the word of Jesus in John 18, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And we thank you, Jesus, for your word. And we pray that you give us the strength that only comes from you to do all that you ask us to do in this life. Whatever road you have us walk on, I pray for strength of mind, heart, and soul to complete the tasks ahead of us. May you be our guiding light. And Father, we lift up the Lagerquist family. Their mother was taken to heaven this week. And we ask, Father, that you put your loving arms around this family Hem them in on all sides till their grief has passed. We also lift up Mark, that you grant him strength of mind and heart to perform the funeral service. Comfort him in his pain in his leg as well. Please heal him, Lord Jesus, and give him your words to speak and comfort and love to his friends. And we praise you for this blessing. Father God, we lift up Harrison, that you would provide healing for his heart. Get him to the doctors that have the wisdom to help his condition. And let the blood of Jesus wash over him and comfort him. Comfort Mark and Lori as well. Let them cast their cares on the God who heals, for you will take good care of Harrison. And we thank you for that blessing, Lord Jesus. Father, we lift up Becky and her family and friends. Please comfort her through the loss of her friend last week. May you always walk with her and guide her always to you. Be gracious and merciful to the family that lost their loved one in a terrible car accident. Be with those first responders and bless them for always doing your work and helping others. Calm their minds and hearts. Help them to remember you are a loving and merciful God. Nothing goes unseen by you. You will comfort your people. May you bless them through this tragedy. Father God, we lift up Becky's friend Kim, who is in hospice and fighting a battle. May you comfort her, give her courage to face this time. Walk with her, Father God, and be with her always, and help her to know that she is loved. Father, we lift up Amanda and thank you that her surgery went well, and she is in, a, she is in another healing stage that brings her closer to her kidney transplant. Please heal and strengthen her through these days and months ahead. We praise you for this blessing, Jesus. And Father God, we pray earnestly for those that have lost loved ones and their homes in the past hurricanes that came to destroy so much. We trust you, Jesus, for all things. You can make all things new. You comfort your people when they are in despair. Please keep bringing them the help they need to get back on their feet. Give them provisions to make it through each day. Help them to look to you and not their current situation. 
for you can make a way in the wilderness for them to renew their lives. Thank you, Jesus, for not forgetting these people. Be merciful to them, oh my God. And Father God, we want to praise you for our children and grandchildren. May they honor you throughout their lives. Father, we lift up the homeless to you and we ask that you see them in their struggles. You know their hearts and minds. Only you can lift them up and out of their current situations. We pray that they will find you and get the help they need. For you are a loving God and you wish for none to perish, but for all to find everlasting life. Help us to all shine your light in this dark world, that all who come in the name of Jesus will be saved. Thank you, Yahweh Suri, the Lord, our rock. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. Well, as we come to this period in our service today, which is our end of our online portion of our service, I invite you to uh, uh, make sure that you click on the link uh, for the music that we have curated for today. Um, hopefully it will speak to you as it spoke to me when I was putting it together. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about as we're talking about being a covenant people and coming back into a right relationship with God, uh, time is at hand. Time is at hand. No one knows the time or date when when that trumpet will sound and will be called up. Following that, there's going to be seven years of tribulation, horrible things on the face of the earth, but following that, what God wants us to be a covenant people for and bring these people back into a relationship is for that coming golden age, a thousand years of peace, no war, no death. He wants that for us. That could be seven years away. The end could come tomorrow. We don't know. For those who are struggling with a commitment to God, now's the time. Now's the time. He gave us a wonderful promise of a future to come with him. And all it takes is faith. That's it. It doesn't cost anything. You can't buy it can only pray and put the faith of God in your heart and that resurrection life. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you today with a humbleness of heart, and we've all messed up and fallen short of the glory of God, but you assure us that's not where we have to stay, lost in a lost world. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your unending love and your forgiveness. Help us to be strong in you, strong in our faith that keeps us from falling and brings us into your glory. Restore us today. Reconcile us and redeem us today. Lord, help us to be your hands and feet and bold us to go forward. Equip us to bring those people who you need back home with you, back into your presence, into your relationship. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your holy name today. 